Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. How many of you have read the, the Lord of the Rings trilogy or watched those movies? See some hands. Great. Got, got a good number of you here. I, I personally love the Lord of the Rings. It was one of my favorite books that I read in, um, in high school, and I reread them again in college, and I really should, should do it again. Just this epic journey of Frodo. I, I know it makes, me, it makes me a nerd, but I think I'm okay with that. So um, it's just a really fun, um, really fun story of good versus evil, and the weak Frodo, the hobbit, who is having to make this difficult and dangerous journey into the heart of darkness towards Mount Doom and under the eye of the Dark Lord Sauron himself. Now, we're going to start talking a little bit about the Lord of the Rings because I think it actually offers a parable for us, um, a parable for us to better understand the book of Joshua and what that means as we're reading about in the story this week, but then also better understand our own lives and the continual struggle and battle that we go through each and every day. So Tolkien's uh, trilogy here, The Lord of the Rings, it's this epic tale that as you follow the main protagonist, Frodo the Hobbit, he begins in his own, um, his own place, the Shire. And the Shire is, is kind of like a sanctuary, uh, a refuge, if you will, and it's only just begun to be impacted by the evil which is otherwise like uh, spread throughout Middle Earth. And, and so Frodo is from the, the Shire here, but um, he has a ring. And it's the one ring of power. It is this magic ring. And this ring is the key to defeating the evil one, to defeating Sauron and all of his minions. And so Frodo has to go on this, this harrowing journey. You know, he's encountered by evil monsters, by scary creatures, like along this journey. And it turns out at the end, the scariest creature of all was himself. He is uh, desiring to have this ring and to use its power for himself. And he has to fight and struggle like the entire way. Eventually, he gets to the end, and he gets to Mount Doom, and he successfully destroys the ring in the, um, in the volcano there. Sauron is defeated, the enemies are vanquished, and if you're reading the, the books, I think especially you can finally relax, right? You've got to the end, and it's been pretty stressful along the way. At least if you, um, if you like Frodo, anyway, and are sympathizing with him, it's been pretty stressful. But you finally get to the end, all the armies are vanquished, and then Tolkien does something to us which seems kind of mean, actually. He gives the, it's the second to last chapter, the penultimate chapter of the book. It's called The Scouring of the Shire. So they're they're on their way back home to their idyllic shire, right? You you get to this uh, penultimate chapter, they get to the edge, Frodo and his hobbit friends, and the shire is burning. They get there and it's um, it's being attacked. It's being overrun by Sharky and his own minions, so by evil itself. So you've been through all this stuff, and you expect that, okay, finally it's done, right? Like, finally the battle is over. But no, there's still all sorts of battles to go on. Like, the war, if you will, is over. Sauron has been defeated. But yet now here, at the scouring of the Shire, Frodo and his friends have to keep fighting. And they do. They fight, um, and they conquer this local evil. But I think exactly this fact, I think is really useful for us. You know, they've already defeated the greatest enemy, but yet they have to keep fighting. They've got to clear the shire of all the evil to get it back to the good land that it used to be. And it's a little surprising when you read in the book, I think, because that's not the way most, um, you know, most of the time you hit the climax and then the fighting's over. But I think that is exactly the way life usually goes. I mean, so for instance, think of marriage, right? So we Americans, we put so much time, effort, and energy into the day of the wedding. You know, we, um, oh, what are they saying these days? Tens of thousands of dollars we put into the, the wedding day. Uh, you, all the planning and preparation that goes into it, so much time and energy is spent on that day. And eventually you get through the day, it goes off with only a few small hitches. No one really cares about those anyway. And you, you make it through until you've conquered the world, right? You've conquered it. You've defeated it. You've gotten through the wedding day. But then, of course, we know how it goes. All right, 18 months later or so, um, you wake up one day and ask yourself, why is this so hard? Because each day feels like a battle. 
Now, as long as the couple recognizes that the battle that they're undergoing is not against each other, right? The battle is for the marriage. And if they recognize that and they're fighting for the marriage, then this struggle is a good one. It's a salutary one. It's a holy and necessary one. As they fight to respect one another, to love one another, to commit to each other each and every day anew. You know, the wedding is finished. You know, the, the war has been won, but the battle keeps going on. Turning our attention to, to Joshua, I think the same thing is going on in the book of Joshua. So remember first where the, the story of Joshua fits within the, the broader scheme of the story of God and his people. Now, God has already saved his people from uh, the land of Egypt, from the hand of Pharaoh, and from slavery to the false gods there. It was by powerful plagues, by his great promises, that God brought his people out of Egypt. You know, he even baptized them in the waters of the Red Sea as he led them through to safety on the other side. God showed that those false gods were at best, you know, hunks of junk, mere statues, and at worst, they're part of those spiritual powers and evil forces of this present darkness, that they are in league with the demonic. But God, you see, out of those things, picked this people for himself, made them his own, and then he led them. We followed them to, to Mount Sinai, where God made his covenant with his people, and he threw even blood, he sealed it. He said, I will be your God, and you will be my people. I will commit myself to you and be faithful to you, come what may. So this is what God does for his people, saving them, making them his own. And he's won the, the war, if you will. He has made them his own people. They are his. They belong to him. But then in Joshua, we get to the edge of the Jordan River. We get there, and Joshua is now taken over from Moses, who has just died, and we find out there's still lots to do. They stand on the outside of the promised land looking in, and there's still lots of battles that need to take place. This land, too, and the people there, they're in slavery to these false gods. They're in slavery to, to death and evil and all kinds of oppression. You know, God won the war when he made Israel his own, but yet the battle, that continues to rage on. So it is also in our lives as God's people. In this adventure we call the Christian life, the war, it's been won, but the battles, man, they keep going. You know, God won that war, though. Let's not forget this. When he sent his son, Jesus, and it was Jesus who made this journey from heaven to earth, who became incarnate as a man, the very son of God, and who entered into our world. You know, he had all power to be separate from, like, the, the trouble of this world, but he didn't do that. Now, he came into the likeness of sinful flesh. He became sin for us. He took on all the difficulties and struggles, the temptations of this world, and he entered into it for you and for me. He made the journey, this difficult journey, into the heart of darkness. And along the way, I mean, think of all the, the things that he encountered. Satan himself, he had to fight against Satan, tried to tempt him away from the path that God put him on. He faced enemies and principalities that wanted to kill him, that wanted to, to lead him on a different path. But Jesus, he persevered on this path into the heart of darkness, into this venture into doom, for it was on the cross. You know, while the, the sky was black, that here, that Jesus received the full force of the wrath of God, the full punishment for sin being judged for crimes he did not commit, but for yours and for mine. And here, Jesus received even death and doom itself. And it was out of this, in fact, that God raised Jesus from the dead and declared that in his Son, Jesus Christ, that you and I, all people everywhere, receive forgiveness, justification, that are right with him by faith. And through Jesus, in his resurrection, guilt no longer has any power over us, for Jesus absolves. It is sin that no longer holds us, for Jesus forgives. Death even has no authority, for Jesus is alive, and he gives you eternal life by faith in him. Jesus, he's won this victory, and it's yours in his name. 
And yet, if you will, the shire is still burning. That is, sin is running amok in our world. The structures of malice and injustice are everywhere and hold many in hostage. Yeah, the war is over, but man, the battles go on. Every single day, you and I have to fight against sin and evil. We're called to to get outside of ourselves and to love our neighbors when think of all the forces that are trying to get us to think about ourselves. Make looking out for number one, if you will, making that our first priority. We're called to, to use our time and our money, our resources in service to others. But man, our society continually bombards us with messages of how much more stuff we need, how many more things we need to buy. We don't really need how many things that we should desire and desire more and more, rather than using these things to serve others. In that battleground, the temptation, it's not only a matter of those things out there, right? The worst part of all is the stuff that comes right here stuff that comes from inside of each of us. We are, of course, redeemed by Jesus, yes. We are saved, but we also remain sinners. If you will, the battle lines, they've been drawn, only they run right down the center of each one of us. This is why Martin Luther talked about the Christian person being not one person, but actually two persons. Uh, On the one hand, we are saints, Redeemed by Jesus, saved, and by faith, we trust in him and we live there, and that's who we really are, justified in Christ. And yet there's another reality that remains true, too. It won't last forever. When Jesus comes back, this will be done forever. But now, we still remain sinners. We have these desires that push us to do things we don't really want to do. We have these desires that push us away from God towards sinfulness. The battleground is me. So Jesus, he says, I'm righteous, forgiven. But in my own experience, I know myself to be a sinner. I know the temptations that comes right here from myself. And that's the battle for all of us. Even though we are baptized into Christ, we're saved in him, we have to fight each day against the sin that remains. And we've got a battle against the lusts of the heart that go after pleasure more than godliness. And we've got a battle against our, our love for money and things and stuff. And we've got a fight against the doubts that creep into our mind that begin to pull us away from our Creator and our Savior. The battleground, it's right here. It's our own persons. And we have to fight against our sinful desires and trust in Jesus and His Word. I think in the midst of this battle, the book of Joshua brings us some great comfort. There's a word there that God gives to Joshua that is true for you too. And it's really the heart of what I want you to get and see in Joshua. So in Joshua 1.9, God tells Joshua, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be discouraged. Do not be afraid. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Let me say that again. Be strong and courageous, Christian friends. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. That's the promise God made to Joshua, and it's true for you too. But I think through the book of Joshua, and as you read through the story this week, it's that promise that resounds. You can see God keeping this promise throughout the entirety of the book. So, as you read through the, the story, Joshua, you're going to see lots of battles. The people of Israel are fighting against the enemies of God's people over and over again. But don't think it's just about Israel and about them fighting these battles. It's really about God, God battling against his enemies. After all, Israel is not that strong, not that fierce, not that powerful. Yeah, but it's God who goes with them and it's God who fights for them. So I think we can see this really clearly in the story of, of Jericho. Of course, a familiar story. Um, but there, in the story of Jericho, you see how 
God leads his people into the promised land, and they begin to fight here, and he has them do some weird stuff, right? They begin to circle, right? They're told to, to circle the city. You've got one time each day, right? And each day they, they do this. I mean, if I did this during a sermon, you'd think I was nuts or crazy. Um, keep, keep doing this one time each day. And then, again, seven days later, uh, or the seventh day, they do it seven times. That's all God has them do. Sound some trumpets, and then, boom, the walls fall down. God fights for them. God destroys the enemies. And I think even here, though, uh, don't get lost in the detail of like the destruction that's happening, e- or don't get lost in the destruction, because even here we can see how God's heart is not even against the Canaanites, but God's heart is also for them. God wants to free the Canaanites from their enslavement to the forces of evil, to the gods that are asking them to do things like child sacrifice. Then we can see this with Rahab, I think, very clearly. So uh, in Jericho, God saves Rahab. And Rahab, she's not like, not only is she not an Israelite, she's not like a wealthy or prestigious person either. She's rather a prostitute, one who you would think would be an outsider. But no, God invites her in and makes her a part of the community. God brings her into this story of salvation. Here, I think we see the ultimate goal of the conquest of Israel. Not destruction, but rather redemption, salvation. God desires for all to be freed from the oppression to evil and to come and worship him, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God the Creator and Savior. You see, God fights and God saves. That's the enduring story of Joshua. So we'll see God fighting other battles too, like you get five Amorite kings who come in at Gilgal, Uh, as Israel goes to defend one of their allies. And here, these these five Amorite kings, they want to destroy Israel, destroy them completely. But it's God who fights against this formidable foe too. God throws them into confusion. God throws down hailstones on them. And then God also makes the sun stand still as Israel then wins the victory. My point is that like, it's almost like Israel is just like standing off to the side, twiddling their thumbs, and God is the one who fights for them. God is the one who saves. And that's also the comfort for you and me. Now our battle, admittedly, is far different. We fight against those spiritual powers of darkness, the spiritual authorities, the principalities and powers of injustice, of malice, and most importantly, of sin. The ones that pervade not only the world out there, but also ourselves. You know, the battle is different, but the promise remains the same. Be strong and courageous, dear friends. Do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. As you journey through life, Jesus goes with you, and Jesus, he is the one who won the war for you. He doesn't leave you alone. He will never leave you nor forsake you. But rather, trust in him. Keep your eyes fixed on him as you go through these battles. Know that in his cross and in his resurrection, you have forgiveness and you have the promise of everlasting life. Even as life might seem like a battle, he is the one who won the war already. and He will win the battles for you too. In Jesus' name. Amen.